Hey y'all, welcome to my channel. My name is Lore. So the whole purpose for this reading vlog is honestly just to try to get my currently reading pile down. I have been in such a weird reading mood lately where I pick up a bunch of stuff, get into it, and then I'm like, yeah, I don't want to read this right now, and then I switch to something else. It's just not how I like to read. It's not what I prefer to do. The whole purpose of this vlog is to really just pare that list down. So I have a stack here that are basically all the books I'm in the middle of, and this is what it's looking like. Plus I have an ebook that I'm 50% into. So why don't I just talk about that book first? And that is The Curious Beginning by Deanna Rayborn. I'm like on chapter 17 and like the progress bar is showing at 50%. So I'm about halfway through it. It is, I don't even know how to describe it. Essentially we're following a main character named Veronica Speedwell who is a specialist in butterflies. There is a specific word for it but there's no way I'm gonna remember that. At the beginning of the novel she goes back to England from being off and exploring the world and capturing butterflies. So she comes back to England to nurse her aunt but then her aunt actually passes away and right after the funeral Veronica is attacked she is saved by this baron and he essentially is like your life is in danger so let's skedaddle and uh he takes her to london and places her in the care of a man named stoker and then from there the plot takes off and they have to kind of go on the run as well but he's supposed to be in charge of her and she's like this is so weird and then they're also trying to solve a murder and prove their innocence in a murder so it's just a lot going on it's definitely that 1800s mystery crime vibe and plot with me being 50 percent into the book i can say that i'm not like super loving it i'm definitely enjoying it and it's been entertaining enough but veronica as a character She's interesting. She she is not like the other girls. She is just so different. Allegedly. Yeah, so anyway, long story short, I don't dislike her. Actually, I like her enough, but she annoys the shit out of me at the same time. So it's like, mm, yeah, I don't know. And I will say I'm very intrigued to learn more about Stoker. He seems like a very interesting character and I guess I am intrigued to continue on and just like see where the story pans out or how it ends. That is the ebook I'm currently reading through my library so I'll probably focus on that one first since I'm 50% into it and all of these other ones I'm not nearly as far into. I'm also right at the beginning of The Well of Ascension by Brandon Sanderson. This is the second book in the Mistborn trilogy. This is getting its own vlog, so I'm not even going to bother with this book in this vlog. And I actually did an entire vlog for the first book. If you're interested in that, I highly recommend it. I'm also on page 12 of Spring Snow by Yukio Mishima. This is a book written in 1969, I believe. It's translated from Japanese. It is translated by Michael Gallagher and it's considered a classic of Japanese literature, more, more so I think a modern classic, but it is historical fiction set in early 1900s Tokyo. And just from the first 12 pages, this book might just be a bit too intelligent for me. Yeah, I don't know. I'm very much intimidated by this book. I wanted to read it in the beginning of April, but I never got around to it because I was hit with a reading slump. And I just, eh. I don't know, maybe I will look up a bit more information on this just to go into it with more background knowledge so I don't feel quite as lost. I am also reading One Dance with a Duke by Tessa Dare. This cover is atrocious and the main character doesn't even look like this. He is said to have long dark curls. Do you see curls on that man? I do not see curls on that man. Anyway, that's so besides the point. I do like the spine because the spine is green. Yeah, I mean, that's all I talk about it for right now. You see that cover and you know what it's about. I've also started The Virgin Suicides by Jeffrey Eugenides. Eugenides? Eugenides? Yeah, Eugenides. Okay. Wow, can we talk about how gorgeous this cover is? I am obsessed. Again, when I get more into this one, I'll talk about it more. Sorry, I was I was debating on whether I should explain my history with the story or not. We'll talk about it later. And then the nonfiction book I'm currently reading is The Girl with Seven Names Escape from North Korea by Hyung Seo Lee with David John as a co-author. It's about her life in North Korea, her escape from North Korea, and just her journey, her story. I am on page 40 and 
I will say if I were to compare this book to In Order to Live by Yeonmi Park, which is another book from a person who has escaped to North Korea, I would say that this book feels more polished. That's really all the thoughts I have so far in it is if I compare it to that book, this one just feels a bit more polished, which isn't a bad or a good thing. It's just a, like a whatever thing. I really do want to keep going with this. I genuinely think that it is a miracle we are able to read about people who have escaped from North Korea because that is no easy feat. So I think that listening to their stories and hearing their words is extremely valuable and I genuinely mean that. But yeah, so that's pretty much my update for now and still this is gonna be just like any other reading vlog I do. I'll show you guys what I'm up to a little bit. I'll show y'all what I'm watching, stuff like that. And let's just jump on into the vlog. I just wanted to film a quick update for this reading vlog. Surprisingly, I have been able to finish a book and get more than halfway into another one, even though Edgar and I have been spending a lot of time with my baby brother who came up from Texas to visit. So I'm just like, I guess I'm just shocked that I was able to finish the book long story short. So I ended up reading this book from my library. I read the ebook. I feel like I've noticed I can read ebooks a lot faster than physical books and I think it's because I can make the font super big. Let me know if y'all have experienced that because is it like a me thing or is it an everyone thing where you read faster if the font's bigger regardless of how thick the book is? Back in February I really got into the two Enola Holmes movies on Netflix and I did an entire reading vlog just based off of reading books similar to that. So I thought that this book would honestly give me some of that same vibe with it being a mystery and crime book set in the 1800s with the female lead. So I really thought it would give similar vibes and it did but it definitely is aged up for sure and a little bit more pretentious and not as fun I would say. The writing wasn't bad but if anything it was a little bit overly written if that makes any sense. It felt like the author really threw in every big word that they knew just to beef up the story when I felt like it really didn't need that. So not terribly written but a bit overly written for sure. I didn't really connect with any of the characters. I didn't find them compelling. I didn't really care about them, honestly. I mean, Stoker was cool. He was definitely the character I cared the most about as Veronica was just kind of annoying. I think I talked about that in the last clip, but uh, yeah, her and I would not get along. And being in her head and like reading about her and her thought process was very annoying for lack of a better word, just really, really annoying. So anyway, yeah, I just didn't connect to the characters, didn't find them compelling. I also didn't find the mystery compelling. The first half of the book should have focused more on solving the mystery and less on hiding out in a traveling circus. 
I didn't like that plot line at all. And then like the last half does kind of focus on the mystery and that's the better half. Yeah, so I guess just in general, the pacing was off for me as well. But overall, this book was still enjoyable. It was still entertaining and I never put it down without wanting to pick it back up. So I ended up giving it a three star rating and I think I feel comfortable just leaving it at that really. I have also gotten a lot further into, let's see, uh, One Dance with a Duke by Tessa Dare. I'm now on at page 245 or chapter 15, so more than halfway through it. Basically, there's this Duke named Spencer, and at every ball or every dance, he dances with one person. That's why it's called One Dance with a Duke but he never goes further than that. He never starts courting anyone and he only dances with each woman once until one day he dances with our main character, Amelia. And Amelia has kind of a troublesome family. Her parents have both passed away. It's just her and her five brothers. They are not doing well financially. They're kind of, I guess you could say, losing status. They're losing a bunch of money. They have a bunch of debt. Doesn't help that one of the brothers likes to gamble a lot. And anyway, her brother owes the Duke Spencer like 400 pounds or something like that. And so she dances with him and brings it up because she's more outspoken and not coy about anything. A lot of events transpire that same night. I mean, there's a murder, stuff like that, and a marriage of convenience follows. That's where the story just takes off. So that was explained extremely poorly, but just know that the Duke Spencer, he doesn't really have marriage in mind until it's convenient for him. Amelia needs to marry as well to help save her family from being destitute. Honestly, I'm not gonna lie, I can actually pinpoint the exact pages. So page one through 130, so this entire first half, so boring, so weird, confusing, too many characters are thrown all at once, just not good, honestly. Like one star for those first 130 pages. And I seriously was debating on DNFing this book multiple times, but I'm glad I kept reading it because the story from here on has been very, very well written. Just like the relationship between Amelia and Spencer, it's just, I, I don't know how to describe it but it was very entertaining, very well written. You see these characters kind of move away from London. That's where I would say you get to dig more into each of their characters and into their relationship. So I'm thoroughly enjoying it now. We have yet to see how it ends, but if I had just stopped at that 130 page mark, I really would have DNF'd it. I hope it ends on the same note as the last chunk of the book that I've been reading. If it ends any type of way similar to the first part of this book, it'll be a very low rating for me. So like, again, those first pages, one star, and then I would give these middle pages four stars. So if I were to rate the book right now, it'd be three stars. Long story short, let's just see how it ends. on and do a quick update for this reading vlog. So let's just jump in with my review for One Dance with a Duke by Tessa Dare. I know I talked a lot about this in a previous clip, but now that I have finished the book, I do have a little bit more to say. And starting off, I really did not mention a huge portion of this book, which is called The Stud Club. And yes, it's a really, really dumb name, but the main characters even admit it's a pretty stupid name, so no worries there. And anyway, this stud club is a group of men 
who own horses and they basically just drink and gamble and play cards with each other. There's also these tokens, but I'm not going to lie, I don't understand that aspect of the stud club at all. It went right over my head, which is why I think I had a lot of issues with the beginning of this book. Just the way that everything was set up was very odd to me and a lot of that setup had to do with explaining the stud club and the people in the stud club and the rules of the stud club. And then there was a murder of one of the members in the stud club and that is right at the beginning of the story so don't worry it's not a spoiler but uh yeah that whole aspect really went right over my head and it was annoying honestly but I totally understand why the author said up the club the way she did because it's how she was able to set up the plot for this book which is a little bit grating honestly and annoying as well like I've said so yeah the beginning terrible the stud club terrible which means therefore the setup to this book was a bit terrible but the rest of the book had so many more amazing aspects that I thoroughly enjoyed and I ended up sitting this book at a 3.5 star rating because I, I couldn't give it higher with the way I despised the first 130 pages like I've discussed so 3.5 stars since the stud club kind of centers around horses there's a ton of horse talk in this and I don't really know anything about horses I'm not a horse girl but there's a lot of horse aspects into this book and there is an animal death scene. It does happen off page but it's talked about and it's really sad. I don't know if this sounds really bad but I can read pretty much anything when it comes to humans but when it comes to animals I don't know why I can't handle stuff with animals. I don't know. Just thought I would mention that because I don't like picking up books that have a lot of like animal stuff. Yeah. And as someone who loves horror, like I'm kind of sick of it to be honest. It sounds like I'm saying I don't care what happens to humans and I care more about animals than I do humans. I'm not saying that. I hope that is not how this is coming across. But anyway, I thought I should mention it because it bothered me, okay? I really enjoyed that the main female lead, Amelia, was plus-sized. I love seeing that in romance books, I'm not gonna lie. I love having a plus-sized main character just receiving all the love. And also, Spencer suffers from anxiety and panic attacks from large crowds or just like bigger social events. And I just thought it was fascinating that a book written in 2010 kind of had that representation in it because you don't really see that often from older books. Not that this is really, really old. I mean, 13 years ago, but I mean, I've never really read about it in a romance book from that time. Another aspect of this book that I thought was really fantastic were the discussions around family and sibling relationships and dynamics and stuff like that in regards to Amelia and her family specifically and how she had to have this moment of... I guess you could say clarity when thinking about her brother who has a gambling issue. Having to have that moment or that last straw with a family member and just looking at them in an entirely different way. I just thought that was a really interesting aspect of the book and something I can relate to, not really the gambling thing or anything like that, like I'm not putting anyone in my family on blast, but just as I've gotten older, you do start to see things and you do start to see family members differently than how you viewed them when you were a child. So that's just something I found interesting. Also, I don't know what Tessa Dare was doing when she wrote this book, but the smut or like the spicy scenes were very, very good and very well done. There weren't too many of them. And the ones that were there were done super well, thoroughly enjoyed them. And I am not someone who likes smut in books. I am indifferent towards it or I dislike it. There's never a time where I'm like, wow, that was really good. Like, I loved that. But in this book, I did. So that was a nice surprise just to be like, oh, that is something I can enjoy in books if it's done really well. I really loved just diving deeper into Spencer and Amelia's characters and their relationship together like I talked about in the last clip but I can admit that both characters can be frustrating and angering and make really dumb decisions and say really dumb and mean things but there's always that discussion afterwards about feelings. I just I love that communication. Communication is key you know. Hydration is key but also communication is key and while these characters could be annoying at points, they were never as annoying as Veronica Speedwell in A Curious Beginning because that woman, mm -mm, she was annoying. No, no, no. 
that was harsh. I'm sorry. So yeah, I guess in the end, this is nothing new, nothing innovative. It's a pretty solid, uh, pretty traditional, I guess you could say, romance. But I definitely enjoyed the last two thirds of this a lot and I want to continue reading it. I probably will just get an e-version of it because mass market paperbacks are just not for me. The font is just too small and yeah, I just... Eh. Okay, and the next book that I want to finish reading and get it off of my currently reading list would be The Virgin Suicides by Jeffrey Eugen Eugenides. Why can I never say this man's name? Eugenides by Mr. Jeffrey. This is considered a modern classic. It says so on the spine, so it must be 100% fact, right? <laughs> Anyway, it was written in the early 90s, I think 93, let me just double check. Yeah, so originally published in 1993, and this book is dealing a lot with, you know, obviously. And specifically, it's about the five Lisbon, Lisbon, sorry, I always say it wrong. Honestly, I'm gonna stay with Lisbon because it sounds better than Lisbon, Lisbon. Okay, I'm just gonna say Lisbon. It's following the five Lisbon sisters who all commit suicide. That's not a spoiler. It's like in the first page and the synopsis. So they all commit suicide. They're living in the suburbs of America. The back says this lyrical and timeless tale of sex and suicide that transforms and mythologizes suburban middle American life announced the arrival of one of the greatest American novelists of the last 30 years. That's pretty high praise. And then there's a quote on the back that says, that girl didn't want to die. She just wanted out of that house. She wanted out of that decorating scheme. And so I feel like that does kind of set the tone for this novel. I'm on page 44 or chapter three. I guess what makes this book a little more intriguing, a little more interesting is that it isn't told through the Lisbon sisters' perspectives. It's told from the neighborhood boys' perspectives from the future looking back on their time in this neighborhood when these girls ended up committing suicide. So that perspective is really interesting and I have my thoughts and my feelings and my opinions on it, but I want to get further into the book before I just come right out and, you know, say what I think the book is trying to do because I'm seriously only this far in, so that would be just kind of stupid. And the writing is exactly what you would think the writing would be. It's <laughs> it's really well written, but it's a bit pretentious, to be honest. Maybe a lot pretentious, to be honest. And if you were a person who was on Tumblr in 2014, you just know the exact vibe that this book and others similar had during that era and during and on that website. I a thousand percent spent way too much time on that site when I was in my teen years and I did go through my little phase. I wouldn't call it an emo phase, I would call it more like a grunge indie alternative phase. I mean these are literally pictures of me during that time and all the music I listened to was like the 1975, The Arctic Monkeys, Arcade Fire, Cage the Elephant, who else? The Neighborhood, Phoenix, Two Door Cinema, just all of that, just all that music, that aesthetic, that just vibe of like, oh, my life is so hard, you know? You know what I'm talking about? That, that energy. And just like, oh, growing up in the suburbs in America is so hard. And, oh, nobody understands me. You know, just teen angst. That's what I'm looking for, teen angst. That is the perfect way to describe it. But anyway, during that time, this movie and others like it were praised and you would always find clips and excerpts and gifts from these movies and you could reblog them or repost them and it it was just like the aesthetic you know and I definitely did that a lot especially with clips from this movie and I watched the movie and I loved it I was a menace back then I mean I thought I was so deep that's so embarrassing but you know what can you say? Teenagers are going to be teenagers. I'm definitely excited to continue on with this and just see how the writing goes, how the story develops. I can't say I remember every single detail from the movie, so it is kind of like I'm going into this a little bit blind. This is a UK paperback, and why is it so stiff? Just no flop. No flop. It's so stiff. Look at it. So stiff, and it's 
difficult to read un unless I break the spine, but this edition is so beautiful. I don't want to break the spine. But anyway, I'm rambling and I really don't have much more to say. I'm going to read more of that, finish it up, and then we can jump into whatever book I decide to finish next. I have, I think, two on the list still. What is it? Spring, Snow, and then The Girl with the Seven Names. It has been nice to just bring my currently reading list down because I don't like having too many books going through my head at one time. Yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> update and so that's exactly what I'm here to do but before we jump in let me just light one of my favorite candles that used to be a staple here on this channel and then the seasons changed and I retired it but you know what I'm bringing it back because it smells so delicious literally feels like I'm eating pumpkin bread even though it's May I just I want that vibe I want that coziness and so that's what I'm going to do, you know? So here are the books that I have to update us on. Let me just throw this here. Yeah, the way I just throw that candle around all the time, probably not great. Yeah, so anyway, let's just get on with this in a very chill, cozy, late night type of way. That's just the vibe I'm having right now. Hope the vibe's coming through to y'all. Um, it might not be, but... Oh my gosh. There are a bunch of people laughing outside. That scared me. What are y'all doing up? Ugh. Okay, I think they're gone now. I do have a lot to update on and I have read two books since we last spoke. I finished The Virgin Suicides by Mr. Jeffrey again and I ended up giving this book four stars. I really enjoyed it. Enjoyed's probably not the best word, but for lack of a better word, I really enjoyed it. I think with this being told from the neighborhood boys' perspectives, this book has a large focus on critiquing the male gaze because the Lisbon sisters' story is really all sorts of jumbled up based on the boys' misconceptions, their romantic and sexual desires, and a general lack of knowledge and misunderstanding of what it means to be a teenage girl in suburban America, especially with a difficult and or suffocating home life. I mean, seriously, the boys really project all of that and then all of their fantasies onto the girls in a very dehumanizing, annoying and angering slash frustrating type of way. I mean, their imaginations really just ran rampant throughout this entire thing. And so you really get this skewed perspective of the Lisbon sisters but then there are things within the text if you can read between the lines where you can take a step back and realize that the boys are just I mean for lack of a better term being the boys and not truly understanding who these girls really are and I think a line towards the end really kind of emphasizes that let me find it it says but this is all a chasing after the wind since this is told in the future looking back on something I feel like this is just saying that all of these memories and all of these theories and all this research is just chasing the wind it's impossible to truly understand who these girls were and why they decided to take their own lives but still the boys do it so it's it's stuff like that that makes me think that the author's intent was critiquing that male gaze at the end of the day and even with that 
The male gaze doesn't just apply to the female characters either because you see a lot of very weird descriptions of another character named Trip who is actually a male and he is very much played up to be this very masculine, good looking dude who gets tons of women. Even that becomes an issue. So the male gaze, again, doesn't just apply to the female characters in this book. I mean, you really see it on all fronts. Or at least that's what I saw when I read it. You know what I mean? Especially because throughout this entire novel, the girls really just feel like items that are to be studied because they're mystifying and alluring and sexual that's just like the vibe I'm getting these boys are just obsessed with them because they think the girls are all of these things even though the girls never gave them any indication that they were these things and in the end I thought that all of that was very interesting and very intriguing which is why I ended up giving this book four stars but I couldn't give it five stars because there is a little part of me that thinks maybe that wasn't the author's intention maybe he really didn't go into this trying to critique the male gaze and he just sucks at writing female characters and maybe he just genuinely wrote this wanting to portray that very manic pixie dream girl stereotype especially with the character Lux and you know maybe he just really wanted this to be super edgy so for that yeah I had to take a star off because there is a part of me that's like what if he really didn't mean it to be critiquing that and when the book came out people were like oh wow this is such a great criticism of the male gaze and then he was just like yeah that's exactly why I wrote it you know I'm just like a little bit skeptical just a little tiny bit skeptical you know just a little bit <laughs> and honestly that is not the only theme in this book this book has a lot of discussions about a lot of different topics and something that is constantly brought up is city versus suburbs and you see that he really has this interesting take where you see the cities physically decaying and like the outskirts of the cities just buildings collapsing buildings being abandoned people moving away from the city but then he compares it to the decay of people in the suburbs so that was actually pretty fascinating. I wish he would have spent a little bit more time with that or maybe he did and it just went over my head. Who knows? But I thought that was fascinating. Just like these cities are decaying but the people in the suburbs are decaying, you know? There's also a lot of discussions on religion and abuse. There's just a ton into this and you can really dive deep into the text I think if that's something you want to do. But again, there is just that little part of me who is like, is it really that deep? I don't really think it's that deep, you know, just, I guess I'm just hesitant. Maybe that's the word I'm looking for. The writing is very angsty. It's very pretentious. Definitely those emo vibes, emo in quotation marks, you know, but if you go into it knowing that and wanting that, then the book does an amazing job and it delivers on that in a very great way. So yeah, four stars. I'm glad I read it. I'm glad I read it. Yeah. Oh, also, I feel like I should mention that this book is written pretty nastily. It's definitely not PC at all. And it definitely doesn't leave you feeling good. So keep that in mind if it's something you're interested in. Yeah. I also was able to finish The Girl with Seven Names Escape from North Korea by Hyung So Lee with David John as a co-author. I gave this book five stars. And similar to when I read In Order to Live by Youngmi Park, who was another woman who escaped North Korea. I don't know how to talk about this book other than just to tell you guys it's very important and to read it. I mean, what the f***? Oh my gosh. It's late at night and I guess the sailor just comes out at me. Sorry. What I was trying to say is genuinely what can I say? that would add anything to this book and the topics in this book and her life story just read it just just read it honestly it's it's a very well done book all right so that pretty much brings us to my last book that i'm currently reading which is spring snow by yukio mishima again this is translated from japanese by michael gallagher i think i talked about in one of the very first clips for this vlog 
how I was very intimidated by this book and felt I needed to do a little bit more research before I just jumped in. I have done a little bit more research into this book, the author, and maybe some of the themes discussed and explored. So I think I have a much better grasp on what I am getting myself into. And I actually read a bit further in. So now I'm on page 25, which is in chapter three. Granted, that's really not far at all into this book, but it is further than I was. Let's just talk about the author a bit. So what I was able to figure out from just a few Google searches, I really did not go in a deep dive because I didn't want to spoil myself for anything in the book. Apparently, Yukio Mishima is a very controversial person or figure in Japanese literature and history and politics. And I believe that more so as he aged and got older and came closer to the end of his life, he became a nationalist, very pro-emperor and anti-Western influence. He even created a civilian militia that took people hostage and asked another group of people to help them basically reinstate the emperor or just like get rid of the Japanese constitution of I think 1947. And when that other group said that they weren't going to help him do that, he committed seppuku or the ritualistic suicide by disembowelment. And I think his last words were along the lines of long live the emperor. So that is a little bit of insight into the author. So immediately I'm like, okay, his books are probably going to have a lot of Western versus Eastern ideas and influences, cultures, stuff like that. And just like trying to stay true to traditional Japanese life and things of that nature. And interestingly enough, this book starts off with our two main characters. They're both teenage boys. One is named Kiyoaki. Kiyoaki, wait, let me make sure I'm getting that right. Kiyoaki, yeah, and his friend Honda. And they're both from well off families, aristocrats, arist aristocracy, aristocracy. <laughs> wow. The movie The Aristocats ruined, oh my gosh, <laughs> ruined that word for me. I can never get it right, but I really did love that movie growing up. Si side point, side point. Wow, I've been filming for almost 30 minutes. Wow, okay, let's focus. Yeah, so anyway, they're both from high up families, the aristocracy in 1912 Tokyo, and the book starts off with them talking about the Russo-Japanese War. I mean, the first sentence literally brings it up. When conversation at school turned to the Russo-Japanese War, Kiyoaki asked his closest friend Honda how much he could remember about it. So immediately I'm like, oh yeah, this is definitely going to have those Western versus Eastern themes because the Russo-Japanese War, and I'll actually just read something for y'all so I don't mess it up. So the Russo-Japanese War, which was from 1904 to 1905, was, and this is from Britannica, so I did not write this, but it was a, a military conflict in which victorious Japan forced Russia to abandon its expansionist policy in East Asia, thereby becoming the first Asian power in modern times to defeat a European power. So, I mean, just having that right off the bat in your first sentence definitely means that he has opinions or he's going to put themes of keeping Western influence out of Japan. But I also have come to an understanding that this is a very melodramatic soap opera-y type love story as well. I mean, on the back it says, As they come of age amid the growing tensions between old and new, Kiyoaki is plagued by his simultaneous love for and loathing of the spirited young woman Satoko. But Kiyoaki's true feelings only become apparent when her sudden engagement to a royal prince shows him the magnitude of his passion and leads to a love affair both doomed and inevitable. So I don't feel any intimidation going into this anymore. I feel 100% prepared and like I can take my time with this, digest it, understand what 
Mishima might possibly be trying to say. And yeah. And then also while I was researching, a author by the name of Andrew Rankin, who I'm not familiar with, was quoted as saying that Mishima's work is characterized by its luxurious vocabulary and decadent metaphors. Its fusion of traditional Japanese and modern Western literary styles and its obsessive assertions of the unity of beauty, eroticism, and death. So definitely think it's going to be a dramatic time, but I think it's going to be a very interesting time. And the author's writing did take me aback a little bit when I first started it because it is very luxurious as that other author just said but once you get used to it and you find the flow of it it's so easy to just get lost in it so I'm definitely gonna just make my way through this and then the final update will be hopefully me being like hey I finished this I loved it yeah so those are my updates for now I will check back in when I finish or have something to say about spring snow <laughs> So I kind of have some bad news, not really bad news, but I am going to have to abruptly end this reading vlog right now, cutting it short because Edgar and I are leaving for Texas tomorrow. And then when we come back, we're actually bringing his family with us. So they're gonna be staying with us for a few days. So I'm not gonna have any time to film or edit after today. I'm currently deep cleaning my apartment very last minute. I literally am in the middle of cleaning out the refrigerator. Basically time just got away from me and I did not have enough time to finish Spring Snow by Yuki Omishima. I probably don't have to say the author's name anymore considering how long I've talked about him in a previous clip. I am now on chapter 10 or page 73 so I didn't even get really far into this. I feel like we're seriously right at the beginning of the story. The writing is a lot and it is easy to get into once you do get the flow of it, like I said, but it is tedious at the same time. So I'm finding it difficult to want to pick this up, but when I do pick it up and I spend 20-ish minutes getting into the story, I'm enjoying it. I'm really honestly here for the drama and the toxicness of the love story in this. I mean, since I'm right at the beginning of the story, something I just found so hilarious was the situation between the two love interests. The female love interest just went up to Kiyowaki and was like, hey, what would you do if I was gone? And just didn't elaborate on that and let him spend days agonizing over that question. Just like, what is she talking about? What does she mean by asking that question? He was really just very lost after she asked that question. And then when he found out it wasn't something serious, he wrote her a letter being like, hey, so I finally lost my virginity and I did it with a prostitute. And if you think that would make me hold the nobility women in higher standards because the prostitute sucked. Let me just tell you, that's not true. The prostitute was awesome. Just to like hurt her feelings back because of the days he spent pondering that question. And then he calls her and he's like, hey, I wrote you a letter. Don't read it. And also let's go see a show. So the drama, definitely feeling telenovela, definitely feeling soap opera definitely feeling toxic very toxic but very entertaining so i am going to continue reading this i'm going to film a texas vlog and i will work my way through that i downloaded an e-version so i don't even have to worry about bringing the physical book i also watched some tv and some movies so let me just briefly talk about those first up i watched the call which is a korean horror thriller suspense i really enjoyed it i thought it was very entertaining a great way to spend the evening i definitely had a good time with it. It wasn't very scary, but it was nerve wracking. So I feel like if you're not into horror, that one's probably a good pick. And I really hated the ending, but I respect the ending. Also currently watching Crash 
Crash Course in Romance. That is very difficult for me to say. It was recommended and I'm really enjoying that as well. It has a lot of heart and I very much love the characters and I'm excited to see where the story goes. It just is a good time. And then Edgar and I also went to the drive-in to see Fast X, you know, the newest Fast and Furious movie. I don't love those movies, but I'm in too deep. I've seen them all and I'm going to continue to watch them all, but I have to say that I absolutely loved Jason Momoa's character. He plays the villain in the movie and it was just hilarious. Very unhinged, very chaotic, but definitely funny. I won't spoil anything but there's a part where his character gets punched in the face and loses a tooth and he literally takes the tooth, throws it at the person and goes, you butthole. How juvenile, how juvenile, but how hilarious. It was so funny. So my question for y'all is how many books can you be in the middle of before your brain just gets frazzled? Thank you so much for watching. That's pretty much all I have to say.